right. Good to see y'all. Pretty good showing since a lot of churches are shut down right now. Uh, praise the Lord. I think it's wise for the older folks to uh, probably try to stay, you know, away from people right now. Amen. But uh, ultimately trust the Lord through this. Right on. How are you guys? Praise the Lord. I know this isn't just the survivors. I mean, you know, <laughs> looks like we have three quarters of our people here, or two thirds maybe. Uh, but we need to keep everybody in prayer. Amen. And uh, a lot to talk about. In fact, I've got three messages, but I'm not doing all today. Don't worry. You know, uh, just one out of the three today that I've been that I've worked on. And almost done with all of them. And I was praying about which one should go first, and this one's been in my heart since yesterday. Uh, but a lot to talk about. But uh, as you know, we're not going to be passing out the bags because people see things on their door hanging. They wonder who touched it and everything else. And, uh, but we're going to be doing that later. We're still going to do that. And we're still going to get the gospel out because, hey, we've talked about these kinds of things for years, right? Nobody in this fellowship that's been here for any amount of time, or for a little while anyway, should be freaking out right now. Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father God, we come before you in your son's name, and we just love you so much, and we exalt you, we honor you, and we praise you, Father, amidst uh, this storm of panic that is not just in our country, Father, but through much of the world. And Father, things have barely happened yet. And at the same time, Father, it's been a lot of tragedy in, in many people's lives, Lord. And we pray for their families and their loved ones, Father, that they would somehow, by the calling of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the bride, the church as well, who cry out, come and drink of the water of life freely, that they would hear your voice. And Father, your word says that your judgments come into the earth, that the nations may learn righteousness, Father, and whether this is a specific judgment, as many people think, or it's part of just the fall in general, as many think as well. Either way, Father, we pray that you get people's attention, Lord, and that you draw people to Christ. And we pray that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. And we pray this in your Son's name. Amen. All right. Please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 21. You know, uh, there's a lot of panic going on right now. Amen. I mean, my wife would show me lines at, at uh, you know, Walmart, Costco's, different parts of the state that we're in, and a lot of people are hiding out in their homes, waiting for this thing to pass. Uh, others can't, you know, because they have to do things, you know. It's a lot of different, a lot of different concerns, a lot of worry, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of worry. And as I've mentioned to you uh, for years, we've talked about these things. And I always said, I talk about these things. They may not happen in our lifetime, but we know the birth pains will happen in our lifetime because things do get worse. And Jesus said, evil men, or, or you know, love many would grow cold and, and lawlessness would increase, which we've been seeing. And Paul said, evil men would wax from bad to worse and the last days terrible times would come. Men would be lovers of self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, so forth. And we, we know a lot of those prophecies and we've also studied through the book of Revelation verse by verse two times, almost two times. We're in Revelation chapter 20 right now, not this study, but we're going through it. And uh, I've let you know that this may not pertain to you as far as the end times, the, the tribulation period take place in your lifetime. There's radical application. I've said that over and over again regarding upheaval, regarding trials, regarding these things that take place in the end that relate to us now. In, in, amen? Because the Bible says that we're, man is born into trouble, you know? And James says, when you encounter various trials, not if you encounter various trials, amen? amen? So whether this is, some look at this as a tribulation event, some look at it as though we're in the tribulation period. Um, I don't, I don't specifically believe that we are in the seven year, the 70th week of Daniel, that last seven year period. Although, hey, I'm checking things out. Uh, you know, we just, our country just made a radical peace plan that gives away a lot of Israel's land with Israel, but it hasn't been implemented yet. That happened around the same time, by the way, this thing went down. Kind of interesting, huh? Now, I'm not saying they're necessarily related. It's just, there's a lot of interesting things going on. And I've told you to just be, pay attention but that 70th week of Daniel will begin with a covenant that's actually made with the many that's instituted. I'm not even saying that peace plan is that covenant. 
It's definitely some kind of precursor to it, you know, because things will lead up to that ultimate covenant, which will begin the set last seven years. Some are acting, it's all over the internet. This is a tribulation period. We're in it right now. And, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But I really want to talk to you about more practical things as to how we're to relate to the trial that we're in right now. And I want to talk to you about all of that because you have to focus on the bigger picture to know, to be secure and know who you are in the smaller picture of your own life. Amen. You can't just pretend. You have to look to the Lord through this and his ways and what he says. But I've encouraged you through the years. Don't buckle when the little trials come. When the little trials come, God uses those to prepare you for greater trials in the future. You can learn that lesson physiologically, whether it's, you know, going through something, whether you've been in the military, you've been through, you know, basic training, or whether you've just worked out or trained for something. Uh, you don't freak out, and God doesn't want us to freak out. And the Christians should be the calmest right now. We should be at most at peace right now. Because we, we've read the end of the book, amen? We know how it turns out for those who trust the Lord. Although we should also have broken hearts for those that don't know the Lord and want to reach out, out to them so they can know Jesus, because that was us. That's some of our family members, some of our neighbors, our, you know, our loved ones. And I've encouraged you with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was going through a really tough time in his village when he first started really sharing the Lord's message. And the Lord told him not to be fearful as a youngster, but to make his face like flint. But he started to freak out. In chapter 11, he's even getting some death threats from the people in his own village, and he hasn't really reached to Jerusalem yet. And he's starting to freak out and complain, like even says, Lord, lead him like sheep to the slaughter. Kill these people. He's freaking out. And the Lord rebukes him gently but strongly. And he says, Jeremiah, you uh, have run with the foot soldiers and you have grown tired already. And how are you going to then compete when the horsemen come? You know? And he says, if you fall down in a land of peace, how are you going to contend when you're in the thicket of the Jordan. The thicket of the Jordan was like, was basically the jungle, you know, in the Mediterranean world in that area. It's where the lions, in fact, later on in Jeremiah chapter, I think 47, chapter 50 or so as well, twice it talks about how the lions, you know, come out of the thickets of the Jordan. He's saying, if you're having a hard time right now, ha, when there's peace, these guys haven't actually attacked you yet, what's gonna happen when you're actually in the thicket of it, the thick of it, in the thicket of the Jordan, and there's the horsemen and what have you. Because guess what? He hadn't been to Jerusalem yet. He's gonna have to deal with Jerusalem, not just his village. And guess what? His people would be deported to Babylon. He himself would end up being dragged against his will to Egypt, because some fled to Egypt because they didn't want to obey the Lord and submit to their discipline. Didn't turn out well for them. He'd been in stocks later in prison in a cistern also arrested under the court guard in the court of the guard he'd go through a whole lot more after that and the Lord wants us to view the trials that we go through right now as challenges to strengthen us not to freak us out so we can get, we can get stronger for challenges to come amen and if they materialize in your life and they're stronger you need to be ready if they don't, you need to be an example to your children and future generations of people around you so that they see your example and they can be ready. Amen? So God calls us to step up right now, not freak out. And there's a lot of freaking out going on right now in the body of Christ. This is it! Oh no! And we find ourselves talking more about coronavirus than Jesus, the gospel, the good news. Now I'm not saying you should be really convicted if you're talking, because guess what? Of course, you're going to be talking about that, amen? But don't forget to look to Jesus. Don't forget to realize this is a great opportunity to reach people with the good news. Amen? And don't look at coronavirus as God, because our God, listen, is way bigger than coronavirus. Amen? amen? And we need to look to him. He loves us. He cares about us. He wants to bless us. Now, in Luke 21, Jesus is talking about the end times here. And they ask him, verse 5, uh, verse 5 of Luke 21, and while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with, with beautiful stones and votive gifts, 
See, Jesus knows what's going to happen to that temple not long after he's crucified. They're like, Jesus, check out the temple, you know? Because Jesus has just railed against the religious leaders. Well, show me the temple's awesome, right, Jesus? And he says in verse 6, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be thrown down. I mean, I've been to Israel four or five times, five or six times. They were thrown down. Titus 70 AD, just three decades, less than three decades after Jesus prophesied this. They questioned him saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Now, according to Matthew and Mark, we also know that Jesus, they also asked Jesus actually three-pronged question. That, but Luke's going to spend a lot of time on that answer. That's why Luke focuses on this. What's going to lead up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? But they also say, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Luke gives us a really clear outline of what's pictures of his coming and the end of the age versus what leads up to the destruction of the temple. But you have a lot in Luke, in Matthew and Mark, don't even give you what Jesus, you know, they give the three-pronged question, Matthew does, but it doesn't give you the answer that Jesus gives here, but they give you the answer of the signs of his coming and the end of the age. But Luke has a parenthetical statement showing us that when Jesus began to deal with the signs of the end times and the end of the age, that he stopped and said, but before these things begin to come to pass, meaning before the birth pains that lead to the end come to pass, then he leads up to the destruction of the temple. Unfortunately, preterists, they just look at the whole thing as the destruction of the temple when Jesus clearly gives an outline that there's a difference between the end and what leads up to the destruction of the temple before the end. And we won't be focused on the destruction of the temple, but we focus on the signs of the end. We focus on a lot of promises that Jesus gave us that we need to relate to right now in our lives. And I've been preaching the way I preach for a long time. And you know what? I knew, I know that, hey, we may not even go through that time, but guess what? I know it's been given for reason, and I know the Lord gave these things. He said we're blessed if we read and hear and keep the books, the words of the book of Revelation, amen? For 2,000 years I've been saying that. God knows what he's doing. And I thought it's always because he wants us to look at his control of the big picture, and then we could draw a line to our picture and say it's a lot more, it's a lot smaller than that picture, and I'm ready for that picture if I hate his words. But if he could get us through that, I could apply that to my life right now and be victorious. So whether we enter into tribulation, the great tribulation or not, in our lifetime, the principles should apply right now. And it's interesting. And we'll spend a little bit of time in Luke, but I want to spend time in other scriptures as well. But it's interesting because verse 7, they question him saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And uh, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Verse 10, then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great, what? Earthquakes. And in various places, what? Plagues. There will be plagues. Okay? We're dealing with one right now called coronavirus or COVID-19 because it came out in the very end of 2019. And famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Okay? Now keep in mind, Jesus isn't just addressing the question that Luke states was asked of him. You also got to look at Mark 13 and Luke and Mark Matthew 24. He, they also ask in the sign of your coming and the end of the age. He's abbreviating it because he wants to focus on verse 11, 12 but before all these things. In other words, before what he calls in Matthew 24, Mark 13, the birth pains, the things that lead up to the end, before the birth pains that lead to the end even begin to come to pass, before these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you. And he goes on to talk about the things that lead up to the destruction of the temple. And he goes on to talk about not the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist in the holy place, like Matthew 24, Mark 13, But he begins to talk about how Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. What happens under Vespian and Titus in 68 to 70 AD. Okay? That's why you have this little phrase, which I think is so important, and most people miss it. Most commentators miss it. But before all these things, 
before these things begin to come to pass, before the birth pains, what Jesus called the birth pains, before the end. Then he describes the stuff that happens before the temple is destroyed up into the time the temple is destroyed, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem uh, surrounded by armies, then recognize that our desolation is near, that the Israel Judea must flee to the mountains. And we do know from the early church fathers that when Jerusalem had surrounded, was surrounded by the Roman armies, there was a break for a while because the general left because there was skirmishes elsewhere he had to take care of. And there was a break in the, in the fortification and they let people leave. Guess who split? The Christians that paid attention to this, the church. By the way, that's another evidence that the Olivet Discourse was written to the church. It wasn't non-believing Jews reading this. It was the early Christians. But then when Jesus says at the end of verse 11, look at the very end of it, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven, right? But then in verse 12, he says, but before all these things, then he describes the things that will happen before those things happen, but then look what he does. He picks it up after he describes uh, Jerusalem being surrounded by armies and being destroyed uh, for a time. God's not done with Israel, obviously. Be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, verse 24, which is happening to this very day. Then he picks it up again. Picks up verse, the end of verse 11 in verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And on the earth, dismay among nations in perplexity as at the roaring of the sea and waves. Men what? Fainting from what? Fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. Sound familiar? And we're just in the Brack. We're not even in the birth. I mean, we could be in the birth pain. We're more in the Bracks and Hicks right now. And people are already freaking out. You know? Now, some people are saying, nope, this is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse right now. This is it. Look at the fourth horseman. We've studied Revelation in depth. Let's go to the fourth horseman. We'll go back to Luke. If you want to keep your finger in Luke, it's easy to find, though. Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 5, we find that Jesus is the only one that's qualified in heaven and earth or under the earth who is qualified to open the seven-sealed scroll, amen, which brings the end. And because he holds the title deed to the earth, humanity, he is the ruler, the creator, the redeemer. And in chapter 5, he's celebrated as a, the line of the tribe of Judah, who's, who's a, one who is, looks as to be, he's been slain because he was slain, still bearing his scars. He takes a scroll out of the right hand of the Father. And he's seated at the Father's right hand. He stands up. <sighs> Can you imagine that? Takes a scroll. And then when the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the seals begin to be, get open, the four, first four seals have four different horsemen. He begins to open them. But I don't want to stop. I don't want to start with number one at first. I want to start with number four since a lot of people are on the internet saying we're in the fourth horseman of the apocalypse right now. And I think it's an overreaction. Personally, look at the fourth horseman. Verse seven. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. I looked and behold, an ashen horse. Some translate pale horse, sickly horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with it. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, with pestilence, and by the wild beast of the earth. So they say, look, the pestilence, this is the fourth. Well, there's more than pestilence here, isn't there? There's sword, there's the wild beast of the earth, and so forth. There's got to be a lot more going on. But also, what comes before four? One, two, and three. Let's see if the other three have started because the other three would come before the fourth, right? Look at chapter six, verse one. Then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. I looked and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, we've studied that. Jesus, there's a counterfeit Christ. Just, in, just like Matthew 24 and Mark 13, there'll be false Christ and false prophets, right? That's how the tribulation uh, uh, begins, or that seventh week of Daniel will have the Antichrist making a deal with the many to bring peace, and the people will be saying peace and safety, and so forth. And this, this white horse rider has a bow. He doesn't have a sword coming out of his mouth. Amen? He has a crown, but Jesus has many diadems. He has a Stephanos. Jesus has many di 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 diademas. I've done whole studies on how this is different than, and many commentators that hold a futuristic position typically, and I agree with them, uh, this is speaking of the coming Antichrist who goes forth, conquered and to conquer, 
Do we see the Antichrist going around right now, conquering all these nations? Is that happening? Yes or no? No. Okay, the first horse hasn't happened yet. When you start seeing that, then you can, woo, okay. Verse 3. And when he broke the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Are we seeing world war right now? Yes or no? No, what nations are at world war? Mm, we, don't, we see smaller wars than we've seen in the last century by far. Far less people killed. Uh, this doesn't sound like the second horse is, is, you know, decimating the earth yet. Number three, verse five. Third horse, third seal. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius. A denarius is a day's wages for a working man. So it'll take you a whole day's work to get just one quart of wheat and three quarts of barley. You can get three quarts of barley though. It's cheaper, but it's horse food, but hey, it feed you. For a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Are we seeing worldwide famine right now? I mean, they're running out of masks and stuff, but I don't think they've run out of food yet. My point is, don't jump to the fourth seal until you see the first three seals. And don't freak out. This is the end right now. Okay? And that's what's going on right now. And a lot of people are capitalizing on the panic in politics. You see that. You see the liberals, you know, even though, and you know me, I, I, I cut it straight. If I see Trump doing something unbiblical, i.e. the peace plan, I'll say, oh, I don't care if it offends you or not. I love you, but I'm going to tell the truth. It's wrong. I'm with Jesus first. Jesus way up here. I, you know, praise God for a lot of things Trump has done, but he's down here compared to Jesus. All of us are. Don't ever put him even close in your heart. But I praise God that he's appointed over 200 conservative judges that are pro-life. Amen. That he's done some really, really wonderful things. There's a problem, though, with, with the Trump situation. There's the liberals who everything he does is wrong. And there's a conservative, many times Christians, everything he does is right. Don't fall into either air, okay? Test everything by scripture, amen, and speak the truth. He's done a lot of right things. And one thing he did, and and, and yeah, he made some gaffes coming out saying, yeah, we're gonna nip this in the bud, it's gonna be over pretty quick, and so forth. Yeah, but you know what? He also shut the borders from China right away. And compared to our population, at least right now, and how many people we've lost has been very, very minimal compared to what smaller nations have lost. So there needs to be, we need to cut straight and say there's some credit that needs to be happen, happening too because they've took some pretty drastic measures. He also brought the, the government together with, you know, private business in a big way to help stop this. So there's some things to be commended. But we also have to watch out because there's people panicking, there's people exploiting this in, in, in the Christian faith. This is the end right now. And, you know, and, and they're not cutting, they're not rightfully dividing the word of truth. You've got to be very careful. Uh, the liberals, Nancy Pelosi and those guys, they're like, okay, yeah, let's pass this coronavirus bill. And guess what they snuck in there? Provisions to kill a bunch of babies. Can you imagine? This country is under some judgment. I do believe that, by the way. Because the Bible talks about how when you shed the innocent blood of babies, you're under the judgment of God. God's been patient with us. But the irony, we're going to try to stop a disease that can kill people, but in it, we'll sneak in a provision where we can make sure we can kill a lot more babies. Absolutely wicked in the sight of God. And praise God, Trump's administration or people connected to it, the conservatives and stuff said, hey, we're not gonna, come on. And they were looking bad. Oh, they don't like women. Do you hate women that bad that you're not gonna sign this? You see how Satan twists everything, right? So we need to be praying for our leaders. And Father, we come right now to you in your son's name. And Father, your word commands us in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for those who are in authority. And we pray, Father, for those who are in authority over us, the politicians in this nation, that they would fear you, Lord, that they would kiss the Son, that they'd bow before you, that they would see that their lives are short and they're going to stand before you, give an account for the way they've led. And we pray, Father, that you lead them to bow before you and enact justice and righteousness and mercy and compassion. And we pray, Father, as brothers and sisters in Christ in the church and for the leaders of the church that we would speak clearly at this time without compromise and we speak the truth in love. 
in your son's name, amen. You know, so we need to cut straight, you know, and go back now to Luke 21. And I think it's very, very, very important that we get this, guys, because in Luke 21, we have all these warnings, but we have also some wonderful promises. Again, look at verse 9. Verse 9. When you hear wars, when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be what? Don't be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. A lot of people are terrified. The end's coming right now. It's all over. No, it's not. This isn't even the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. Don't be frightened. I think more people are doing harm to themselves in our country because of fear and worry and anxiety than what the coronavirus has done so far. No doubt about that in my mind. Don't be victimized by untruth. Amen? In fact, Jesus gives us some really, really clear instruction. In fact, Christians ought not to be hanging their heads and hiding in fear. Christians ought to be lifting up their heads, Jesus says at this time. Even when it gets worse, look at verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and on the earth dismay among the nation, among nations. Yeah, we're already seeing some of that. It's just this, is, this part hasn't come pa- to pass to the degree it will at this point. In perplexity, there'll be confusion at the roaring of the sea and the waves. There'll be huge hurricanes, and you see what happens when that happens, right? And, and so forth, typhoons. And, but look at verse 26. Men fainting for fear and the expectation of things which are coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And we're already seeing reverberations of that prior to when this actually takes place. And this is serious. The word fear, you know, means, I I looked up that Greek word, to faint, breathe out life, die, to die, to be dismayed, you see. Uh, It's interesting because we're kind of seeing the gamut of that. The New King James has men's hearts. Men's hearts will be failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. And this is serious stuff, guys. You know why? Because heart attacks are caused by, oftentimes, by great fear, right? And panic. And uh, it's important also to understand that the, the CDC says, quote, heart disease is the leading cause of death for men in the United States. Okay? And anxiety and fear and worry are huge contributors to heart disease. In the end times, people will be dying, falling, you know, their lives will be expiring because of the fear that's going on. And already there's that there's huge concern right here. Because when you have fear, it activates the sympathetic nervous system in your body, right? And what happens is your nervous system sends signals to your heart to boost your heart rate. Kind of like flight, you know, you know, that whole thing about, you know, you know, fight or flight is going on. And there, there's a time when we need to have fight or flight, you know? Somebody's trying to hide or take your wife's car and you're coming back to the car from Walmart because the guy can't get in. He's frustrated. He's gonna go somewhere else. Don't think about that. Don't put thoughts in your head. Never mind. But anyway, then all of a sudden you got to fight, you know? Some of you men might flight. Don't do that. Stand up for your wife, okay? But uh, what happens is, you know, it activates the adrenaline glands and releases cortisol and the adrenaline glands open up and... and uh, uh, neuropinephrine and all of a sudden what happens is your heart rate starts just taking off and it floods your your, you know and and guess what happens your hormonal system your your immune system is then almost debilitated because it has no energy coming from your sympathetic nervous system taking all the energy you see and you're not allowed to fight sicknesses and your heart is racing and Jesus doesn't want our hearts to fill us for fear of things coming on the earth. In fact, look at what he goes on to say. Right after he says in verse 26, man fainting for fear of an expectation of things which are coming upon the world 
for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. He says, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Well, what should our reaction be? Verse 28. But when these things begin to take place, he already says, don't be frightened, don't be terrified, right? The end isn't coming. And when the end does come and people are, are their hearts are failing them and people are keeling over and they're fainting and so forth. But when these things begin to take place, what does he say? Straighten up and what? Lift up your heads. The Bible says that the Lord is a lifter of our heads. Amen? Lift up your heads. This is the Lord telling us to lift up our heads. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. How many times have you heard me quote that verse? Have you heard me quote that verse a lot through the years? A lot. Why? For times like this. Not just for the great tribulation period, but when you're going through things. By the way, notice what Jesus said when he says we're supposed to lift up our heads rather than fall over and kill over. What did he say? But when these things what? When the end comes or when they what? When they begin to come to pass, guys. When you're in the birth pains. When the Braxton hits are there. Hicks are there. Or when people are just freaking out around the world over things that are happening on the earth. The same principle applies, Amen. We're supposed to lift up our heads and look to Jesus, amen? The Christians, we know he's given us the roadmap, amen? We know how it ends, as I said earlier. We know God is greater than coronavirus or anything that hits us, amen? Amen. So we need to stay focused on him and not be terrified and not freak out, but seek the Lord. I praise God. My brother Tom's walking out. I'm sure he's walking back in, but I'm not pointing at his walking out, but he just told me a few weeks ago, he goes, you know, when we were young Christians... I was a very young Christian. I don't know if he was a Christian quite yet, like early 80s. And there was all the fear about the USSR, the Soviet Union, because, you know, uh, Glasnost hasn't hap- hadn't happened yet. And, you know, Reagan was saying, tear down this wall and stuff a little bit later. But he said, he told me this a few weeks ago. He goes, I knew, not that I'm anything, I'm nothing. He goes, I knew to listen to you when you told me about the future of the Soviet Union. I go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, in the early 80s, he goes, you told me that the Soviet Union would come down. And you knew that based on the scripture. It wasn't a prophecy I had. And it's because I shared with him that I knew what he was talking about. In Revelation 18, it talks about a free market, a capitalistic type system, Babylon the Great. When Babylon's destroyed, the merchants of the earth bemoan, they wail, because who will buy their goods anymore, right? Because Babylon, you know, that system of Babylon in the end is known for just purchasing everybody's goods. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't that? And that's at the end of the tribulation period. Some people are like, I had people, oh, we gotta get out of here in case we're Babylon. Babylon's gonna be destroyed. I'm like, Revelation 18 comes right before Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back. It's destroyed under the seventh bowl judgment, the last of the judgments, right in concert with Jesus coming. That happens at his coming, amen? Now you wanna come out of the evil world system and not be part of the world system, but that call in Revelation 18 happens right before Jesus returns. So we always got to make sure we just don't, you know, oh, this, this, that, that. Context is king, amen? You need to look at context always, okay? But, uh, and it wasn't because I was like prof- being prophetic. I just, that's what I see in scripture. It doesn't have, you don't have a communistic world system where everybody's just at the behest of, of the governments. And guess what? We saw it come down just not maybe a few years after him and I had talked. It didn't mean it would get worse for us for a while. I didn't know what was going to happen in the next ensuing years. I just knew that wasn't the end time system. But I also, so you look at the scriptures, and I've known, I haven't done this, but I know things I can invest in right now that I've seen through the years because I know how the world's going to get at the end. You know, technology, mark of the beast, things like that. But I want to invest in certain things. Self-love magazines, because about lovers of self. You know, I saw this. But I'm not going to invest in something that's going to help pursue wickedness. Now, I might have been smart and invested in masks, you know, because that's helpful, right? You know, to a degree. They say it's helpful, I guess, only if you're wearing it, but I don't know how true that is. If you're, of course, if you're wearing it, I mean, if you have it, have the disease, you know, but I'm not sure how true that is. Uh, anyway, this is huge, guys. You know, our minds, people are freaking out. But Paul talked about how we need to put on the helmet of salvation. We talked about the armor of God and being ready for the evil day. And he talked about different and I don't have time to get into all the different pieces of armor, but I love the fact that he talked about the helmet of salvation because that's in Ephesians chapter six. But in 1 Thessalonians five, you remember how he defined the helmet of salvation? He told us what it is. Do you remember what it is? The helmet of salvation, he says, do you remember that? It's a hope of Christ's return. Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. 
looking at the big picture, looking at he's in control, looking that he's going to wrap everything up, that his kingdom is going to come, amen? amen? So instead of freaking out, lift up your head and look to Jesus. But, 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 but he may not come for many years. Well, then that means you're not even in the tribulation period. Amen. So quit freaking out like you are. No, I believe we are. Well, then look to Jesus. Come real soon. <laughs> oh, but I don't know that. It's, well, yeah, either way, look to Jesus. Because the Bible says, looking unto Jesus is often the finish of our faith right now. We're always supposed to be looking to him, amen? amen? Whether he comes or not in our lifetimes. We're supposed to look to him right now. Amen? Now, I love Colossians because, you guys, whether you live or die, I mean, look at Luke chapter 21, verse 16. Luke 21, verse 16. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You can be put to death by some, some of you. We put to death. I mean, can you imagine the heartache of your children betraying you, turning you in? And you will be hated by what? All because of my name. That's happening. Verse 18. I love this. Yet not what? Not a head, not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you gain your lives. This is repeated in what goes on before Jerusalem's destroyed, and it's also repeated with regard to the birth pains. A little bit differently there, by your endurance, he that endures the end will be saved, but similar. I love this, man. They're gonna kill you, but guess what? Not one hair on your head will perish. Isn't that a trip? That's interesting. Guillotine, guillotine, your head rolls. Guess what? Absent from the body is be present with the Lord. They could kill you. And the Bible says we're not appointed to wrath, so we don't have to be concerned about God pouring his wrath on us. He's a really good shot. Amen? Amen. Those who get the grievous sores on their hands, it's those who have the mark of the beast. It says he targets the wicked. But it says over and over again, we are not appointed to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1.9. 1 Thessalonians 5.9. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 says we are appointed unto tribulation though. And Jesus told his apostles, you will have tribulation. And then he said, great tribulation. Yeah, that's, we have flipses from the enemy. God's wrath is pointed at the wicked. The enemy's tribulation is pointed at us. God allows us to go through it because he knows that God uses that in our lives. When we go through some really, really hard times, God wants us to seek him through it because he's, he's molding us, he's making us, he's changing us. Sometimes it seems really, really difficult. Man, I don't know if I can endure much more. Keep looking to Jesus because he promised he won't allow you to go through more than you can handle in him, amen? So, now... In Luke 21, we see this, but I love this, man. Because of whether we live or die, people are hiding right now in their homes. And there comes a time during the tribulation period, Isaiah chapter 26, when it tells the believers to go into the houses, kind of like the Passover, until my indignation passes over you. Isn't that interesting? It's talking about the tribulation period there. If you're in Judea, flee to the mountains, because <laughs> that's right where the Antichrist set up camp. But a lot of the other parts of the world... Go into your homes until the indignation passes over. And he's talking about the tribulation and worldwide destruction. But right now, the best place you can hide and the best place always that you can hide, and we ought to be hiding, is in Christ. He is our hiding place. The psalmist writes about how he is our hiding place and he gives us songs in the midnight hour. And whether we live or we die, our lives are hidden in Christ. Listen to what Paul said in Colossians chapter three. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking the things above, meaning if you've been born again. We'll be raised physically, but those who've been born again, regenerated, keep seeking, and you're in Christ now. Keep seeking things above. Get your eyes off of the, this world. Don't focus just on this world. Make your main focus Jesus. I know you have to live in this world, but don't make it your focus. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. See, looking unto Jesus, guys. Set your mind, set your mind on things above. Are you doing that? Are you setting your mind on things above? Or are you so focused on the things of this world? Because if you focus on the things of the world, you know, Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust do corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can corrupt and thieves can't break in and steal. Because if you're focused on this world, guess what? You're going to watch moths corrupt, things rust, people steal things. And you're never going to have joy. Your focus will be in the wrong place. It's going to be like a form of idolatry. Keep your focus on Jesus. 
Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life, listen to this, you have died in your life. Because when Jesus died for our sins, we identify with our old man being dead. Amen? And we're risen with him. For you have died and your life is hidden. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So that we live until the Lord's return, praise God, helmet of salvation. Whether we die before that time comes, helmet of salvation, we're looking to Jesus, amen. Our lives are hidden in him. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, amen. amen. What can man do to us? We don't need to fear. Because even if he chops off your head, not one hair in your head will perish. Because you'll go to be with the Lord. And eventually you'll get a full head of hair, okay? <laughs> amen. I'm saying that thinking about how I'm losing some up here. I already got a little patch back there gone, you know. I always ask the person that cuts my hair if they can put some hair back there. Uh, so, praise the Lord, we have an awesome God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before you, you take up your cross and keep your eyes on Jesus and follow his example. Chad had mentioned how we're going to Texas. Lord willing, we're still planning on it. We're not going to freak out, and we want to be prudent and be wise, you know. I'm not going to go touch everybody and, hey, you know, oh, nice to meet you. Are you the pilot? You know, I'm not going to do that. We'd be wise about it, you know. But my lives are in, my, our lives are in God's hands. Now, if it looks imprudent and unwise, we'll back off. But right now, there's a lot of people traveling without a problem, and there's, we've, a lot of money has been invested by the people that are putting it on and a lot of heart, a lot of prayer, a lot of love. So I want to go there and be of service to the Lord and not, not freak out because my life's, my life's hidden Christ. You know? So we, gotta be, we want to be careful but wise. So I love Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though California falls into the heart of the sea, <laughs> though its waters roar and foam, remember people's hearts would be failing them because of the roaring and the foaming of the sea? Though the mountains quake at its swelling, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Psalm 23, 4, you know it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I dread? Some of people are dreading everything but the Lord. The Lord says, don't let those things be your fear let, or your dread. Let me be your fear. He doesn't, say let, he doesn't say let. He commands us to fear him, okay? But many are fearful by the things going on. And there's paralysis by analysis, you know? There's like, and Satan comes as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He, lo he loves it when people are in that state. You know, why, you know why a lion roars? It seems like the worst, stupidest tactic ever. Because what do animals typically do when they're trying to get another animal? Stealth. Quiet. Shh. We're almost there. You know, and even lions are quiet. But there comes a point where they just, <laughs> are just really loud. I can't talk now. No. And why do they do that? You can hear lions roar five miles away in some places. Why? Because it strikes terror in their victim. And their victim has to think about it. And it gets discombobulated. And then, bam! Not saying they always do that, but they do often roar right before they attack. And that's what Satan's doing right now. He's roaring. For coronavirus. He wants you to focus on that as the most terrible thing that could possibly happen. And there's a lot of panic right now. There should be concern, wisdom, prudence, a lot of hand washing, amen? Count to 20, they say, hot water. Don't count to 20. That's one thing I disagree with them on. Say the Lord's Prayer. Amen. It's about 20 seconds, okay? Still wash your hands, 20 seconds, but redeem the time for the days are evil, amen? amen. That's what I do. Our Father who art in heaven, and if I've washed my, ha my hands 10 times at my house, it won't always be that long because guess what? I just wash my hands and, okay, I pick that up and just 
Some, but when I've been somewhere, or I'm, you know, going somewhere, or I've touched something that's from someone else, then I might go 30 seconds, you know? I say, Lord, prayer. Don't say, oh, Mary's. It's the Lord's prayer, okay? All right, or whatever the Lord leads you to say that's biblical. But you know what? The Bible says Satan roars a, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, okay? But you know what Peter says to do in that same, those same verses? Cast all your anxiety on the Lord because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Amen? Amen. The Lord really cares for you. Not just for us corporately, he cares for you individually. Jesus said he knows every hair on our head. Jesus says that sparrows are cared for by our Father in heaven. And even when one of them falls to the ground, it's not without the Father's knowledge. That blows me away, man. His brain, spirit, you know, his mind, I should say. But Jesus says, but you are of greater value than many sparrows to Jesus, to the Father. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? He cares about that little sparrow, but you, he cares about you way more than many sparrows, Jesus said. That's heavy, guys. And he said the same thing in Luke chapter 12. He said, who of you, by worrying, can add one day to your life? One cube, one, just one little bit to your life by worrying. You can't. You, worrying doesn't add time to your life. And then he talks about, consider the ravens of the air, that God cares for them. And then he says, how much more does he care for you? I love that. Two different times, distinct times with two different types of birds. He talks about how he cares about these birds. I love that. But he cares about us. And I love this even more, far more than many birds. So he says not to worry. Don't freak out, Amen. He knows what you're going through. But, but I don't see him around. Remember the disciples? They're on the, on, on, in the sea. These are rugged fishermen. And, but the sea was just roaring like, the, 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 we're not talking about the Mediterranean Sea. We're talking about the Galilee, which is like a big lake like Tahoe. But it, it could, water, water would go through that, or I'm sorry, wind would go through that valley and could really kick up some big waves 30, as high as 30 feet. You could die. And they're freaking out. And then Jesus walks in water. Be courageous, right? Don't be afraid. Amen. He stills the storm, amen? He stills the storm. You need to look, and I need to look to Jesus. Now, we need to be in prayer, amen? We absolutely need to be in prayer right now. Paul said, don't worry about what? Anything, but pray about what? Everything. And we need to be in prayer. So don't also, you can, you don't say, oh yeah, I'm not panicking. And just put your head in the sand and ignore what's going on. And, oh, I can tough it out. I'm tough. No, you'll find out that you're not that tough. Because these plagues and viruses and things that will come upon the earth are not greater than God, but they are greater than us. Amen? So we need to look to the Lord. And Paul says, you know, in everything, with prayer and supplication, right? With thanksgiving, make a request known for God. Pray for everything, Right? Okay, and he said, don't be anxious right before that about what? Anything, right? But pray for everything. And it's interesting because Jesus understood the importance of prayer. Jesus prayed radically. And we need to be praying radically right now. I mean, I'm talking about lifting your hands, bowing before the Lord, getting on our knees at times, prostrate before him at times, you know, just seeking him in prayer. It's huge, it's so important. And it's interesting because when we think of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus had just warned the disciples the night before he was crucified, before he was arrested, at the Last Supper, that there's one here, one of the 12 that's going to betray me. That was Judas. But he also said that all of them were going to deny him. And Peter freaked out. Lord, they may deny you, the rest of the disciples, but I'm ready to go to prison and death with you. Remember that? I'm not going to fall away. And then they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus said, there was a few of the disciples with him. He said, yeah, let's pray. They began to pray. They just had a Passover meal. They were stozing off, falling asleep. Right? Jesus is praying very intensely. Right? 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying. You ever cry real loud? That's a lot of, that's when you're in a lot of pain. Loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Wow. So he's got this loud crying going on. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus, in, in, in Gethsemane. Loud crying. You'd hear it from long away. Ah, oh, just bawling. And the disciples are sleeping. Right? And if you were a bystander, who would you think had peace? Jesus or his disciples in the storm? You would think the disciples, right? If you didn't know better, right? Jesus goes to the disciples and wakes them up and says, could you not pray one hour with me? I mean, that's a powerful statement. If I'm Peter and I just said, I'm ready to go to prison death with you, but I can't even, I believe that's why he's saying that for two reasons at least. Can't you pray one hour with me? You're ready to go to prison death with me, but you can't even pray with me when I, I ask for prayer for an hour. And also he's gonna go to the cross, right? But they can't even pray for an hour. And this is, that's heavy. If you were a bystander, though, you would only hear this loud crying. You'd see blood streaming down his arms and perhaps his face from the capillaries popping, right? And mixing with sweat and dropping to the earth. Hematrodosis says. Doesn't use that word, but that's the condition. Only talked about. Only 100 plus people have been known to go through that on earth, according to forensic science. Luke's a doctor. He records it truth of God's word right there man but what's interesting about that is you would think wow he has no peace but if you knew the bigger picture you would realize wow those guys are disobedient to his word he asked them to pray told them to pray they're not doing it he's praying because he's in a spiritual struggle to be obedient to his father and he's under a spiritual attack. And he's praying, Father, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but what? Your will be done. Amen? And he is successful, right? Fast forward a little bit to the cross, and just before the cross, and what do you see the disciples doing in the storm? Denying him, falling away. Peter specifically, but it says all of them did. Jesus prayed to be ready in the midst of the storm and also to be ready for the storm. He ran with the footmen successfully and now he's running with the horses successfully at the cross. Jesus triumphed victoriously at the cross. Did he freak out? Take me down, Father! No, just like a lamb led to the slaughter, the trial, nailed to the cross. If you're the son of God, take yourself down from there I mean, after all, he could have been thinking, look at these disciples I'm dying for. The world hates me that I'm dying for. The disciples. No, he prays for everybody. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was victorious because he prayed. We need to be people of prayer right now, amen? We need to be people of prayer during the storm. Are you with me today? This is important stuff. And I really hope it's registering in your heart because it's very, very serious. Ephesians chapter 5 when the Apostle Paul talked about putting on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil and be able to stand in the evil day because the evil's day, evil days come. We're some pretty evil days right now. He said to put on the whole armor of God, but you know what he said in verse 18? Pray. He emphasized praying too. We need to pray and allow God to use the trials that we're going through right now to strengthen us so we can face the horsemen, so we can face the lion, Satan, in the thickets of the Jordan. Because the thick of the Jordan, whether the great tribulation comes in our lives or not, evil days will come in all of our lives. Amen? You'll find out horrible news sometimes that you're not expecting. You need to be a person of prayer so you can endure the storm when you go through it. Amen? Amen. Philippians 4, verse 4, Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Well, Paul could say that, but he wasn't dealing with coronavirus. <laughs> oh, Yeah? Paul is in a Roman prison. Paul had been chained between two Roman guards. And now he's in a Roman prison writing the Philippians. He could say, I can't believe this has happened to me. 
you know, my faith is rattled. Because Paul had expectations of going to Rome. And he went to Rome, but not the way he originally expected to. He wanted to go there to be a witness and fellowship with the brethren and strengthen the church. He finds himself in prison and a stinking. They're not like the hotels we call prisons in the United States. A lot of these prisons are more like hotels compared to the rest of the world. You know that. Not that they're not bad, you know, but we pray for people that are in them. They know Jesus. But he's saying from that situation, rejoice in the Lord always. I believe he puts the word always there for a reason. He knows what he's going through. And again, I say rejoice. Brothers and sisters, lift up your heads and rejoice no matter what happens around you. You can still, doesn't mean you don't weep with those who weep, doesn't mean you don't hurt, doesn't mean you don't have tears in Gethsemane, but inside, deep down, you have an inner rejoicing in the Lord. You have the joy of the Lord, you're saying, ultimately, I'm looking to you because I know you're good. And I know I can endure this because of the joy set before me. Amen? How could he say that? Because he goes on to say, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Let people see your witness. The Lord is near and, and keep the helmet of salvation on. Be anxious for nothing. Right? Don't be anxious about anything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be worried about a bunch of things. Bring them to God, amen? Be proactive. And there's some things you could take care of. The Lord just says, just get up and do it. Don't worry about it. Certain things, you just that things that are in your control with regard to things going on right now, be wise. Don't be paralyzed by analysis. And then he says, when you do this, and the peace of God, and the peace of God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, the world can't understand it, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We don't want to have our hearts filling us for fear of the things coming on the earth, amen? So we look to him and we pray to him, amen? And then he guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, amen? Because our lives are hid with God in Christ, amen? amen? I love these types of scriptures. Now, Anxiety is the enemy of joy. You can't rejoice in the Lord if you're filled with anxiety because you're not trusting the Lord if you're filled with anxiety. You're looking to the circumstances. You're looking to the waves like Peter got his eyes off of Jesus, got on the waves and he starts to sink. Get your eyes off the waves and get your eyes on Jesus and then you'll be able to walk on the water, so to speak. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's a decision that you have to make. It's that easy. You just simply decide, I'm going to seek Jesus. And, it's not, and, and then you grow in your ability to seek him as you continue to walk in it. Very, very important, guys. Very, very important. So, uh, now it's interesting to me because, very interesting to me, because the Apostle Paul, he, he could have just been freaking out because, man, I wanted to come here and be a witness at Rome, I, and now I'm chained between these guards. It stinks in here, I, you know, I can't believe I'm in this situation. No, he looks to the Lord and he says, Lord, what are you doing? You're always doing something bigger than me. How could I be part of it? And it's interesting. It didn't turn exactly out how he wanted to, but it, and it turned really dark. But I want you to look at a scripture. I think it's really interesting. Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one. Now keep in mind, in Philippians chapter four, you just, uh, I just quoted from it. In Philippians chapter four, Verse 6, 4, 5, 6, 7, which we read, it's talks about rejoice in the Lord always. It's the same letter. Praying, don't be anxious about any, be anxious about nothing, but pray about everything, and he'll give you peace, right? Look at chapter 1, 12. I love this, man. I love this so much. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, being in prison in Rome, have what? Have turned out. They turn out contrary to what he expected they turned out for what the greater progress of the gospel see that guys verse 13 so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else wow the praetorian guard the people that are guarding him and all of the guards are like man this guy's they're, they're hearing the gospel amen remember the gospels at another prison where the jailer came to Jesus Verse 14, and that most of the brethren, check this out, not just the outsiders, not just the world, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, wow, what? See that? And that most of the brethren trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more what? Courage to speak the word of God without what? Fear. We can go through things and learn lessons and learn how to fight the lions in the thicket of the Jordan. 
how to endure when we're dragged to Egypt and we don't want to be there. Amen? We can learn lessons by watching others, but you know what? We need to be among those who set the examples. God help us. Because people need examples. And Paul was an example of suffering and the gospel spreading through him. And so these people say, wait, I need to draw a line from Paul to my God and his God and realize that's how God works. He uses these things. And God uses end time events and horrible events to bring people to himself. Amen? It's just beautiful what we read here. Now, the gospel is offensive, okay? It is. Paul talked about how, you know, if he, was a, if he tried to please men by changing the message, he said, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. To the Galatians, he said, I've be, I become your enemy because I've told you the truth. And there's someone who wanted to believe that they were saved and earned their salvation by their good works, that God let them in because they had earned merit points of some sort. And in the church of Galatia, there was this false gospel going around and the Judaizers had brought it in that you had to be circumcised to be saved. But Paul said, if you added circumcision to the gospel and the Old Testament law to the gospel as a way to earn your salvation, yeah, people would feel better about that but he said, I would remove the offense of the cross. Yeah, you could remove the offense of the cross. But when you remove the offense, the cross is offensive. The Bible says, the, the preaching of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the, 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 the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But it's the power of God to those of us who are being saved. Amen? Amen? So it's foolishness and people are offended by the preaching of the cross. Because the last thing you want to hear is that you're a sinner and that you don't add up before God and that you need to be forgiven and that you're facing God's wrath and it's the point of man wants to people don't want to hear that message but we need to preach the gospel and we need to make sure we don't have fear because Paul said they saw my example and they weren't fearing sharing the gospel now and sometimes we get have fear because of how people react we're not they're fearful there in Paul's day at that time because they didn't want to be going, going to prison but they're saying hey I'm not worried about going to prison we're fearful just because of how people react and we don't do it sometimes God, help us not to be wimpy in that area. Amen? They're fearing death at times in the first, second, third century. We're fearing just people being upset. And yeah, let's be honest, it is offensive when you tell somebody they need Jesus. People don't want to hear that. I mean, think, think if you go to a party and you're hanging out and you meet some, you're, it's kind of you're invited to this party and it's like, oh, this is, wow, a lot of professionals here. And you meet this plastic surgeon and you have a very nice talk with him. He talks about, and like, hey, what do you do? I mean, what is it? You know, da-da-da. You have a good time. Seems like a nice guy and everything. And then all of a sudden he says to you, you know, I could help you with that problem on your face. <laughs> you know? I mean, how do you feel? I mean, I could really help. I see your, I see your huge need. You know? <laughs> I mean, you'd be like, you know? And that's how people are when you share the gospel with them. You know that, right? You're like, you know, you can be saved from your sin. They don't want to, be, don't, they don't want to think of themselves as sinners. They want to think of themselves as righteous. I've done some good things. I'm more righteous than the next guy. I'm going to heaven. A lot of people think that, right? But they're not. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? And what we need to do is let them see our face. Let them see what God has done in our lives, Amen? shine the light of Jesus. People were seeing what the, the ultimate physician, the great physician had done in the Apostle Paul's life. They're like, how is he so winsome? <laughs> how does he have so much joy? Remember he says, rejoice the Lord always. How is this guy so joyful in the prison when everybody else is just so upset and how come he's singing songs and so happy and, and, and what he's saying seems very reasonable when you really look at it. And they were attracted to the gospel because Paul was not panicking, was not filled with fear and trepidation. Amen? We need to make sure that we are a light right now. Amen? Amen. Because people don't need facelifts, they need Jesus lifts. Amen? Amen? They need to lift their eyes to the heavens and look to the Lord. They need to see our deeds, and they need to see our creed by our deeds. Amen? They need to see our faith in Christ, and the content of the gospel. We have good news right now. The world's filled with bad news. We have the best news ever. The creator of the universe became a man in the incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he died for all of our sins and rose again and conquered death. That whosoever will may come to him and have eternal life. Is there any news that comes even close to that? Not at all. We have the best news. We have great news. 
And while the world's freaking out, they're more open, typically, than ever. We need to take advantage of that. And I just think it's very important that we get this. You know, it's interesting. Jesus said that you'll, 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 we'll be known by our what? Our love, amen? Be known by our love for one another. So when everybody else is freaking out, hiding, and there's not a peep, we need to be shouting the gospel from the rooftops right now. Oh, I know, we just got hemmed in because we thought we got all these bags we want to pass out. We're still going to do it. There's just a wiser time to do it. But hey, as long as we can go to Texas, we're still going to do that. We're still doing live streaming. We're still making videos. You know, some of us are still going to go out into the streets. We're not going to give people big hugs and say, let me tell you about Jesus now. No, keep a little distance, but share the gospel. We're going to have some opportunities real soon to where we can just go down to here and see me and other places as a church if you want and just lovingly share the gospel with people. A great place to share, by the way. You know what? A really great place to share. I want to encourage you in this. Okay, Steve, maybe you can help me work this out. And the elders, John and Nick, is when they give the coast is clear to the nursing homes that nobody's visiting for a long time, what a great opportunity to fill that vacuum and just show them the love of Christ. Because they're probably freaking out, thinking nobody come in. They're, think, and they're hearing the news. They're passing around. We could die so easily. Then when the coast is clear, might wait till not just the next day because they might be freaking out about you still, but just, you know, a couple weeks or whatever. Maybe we go into these nursing homes close by and we'd share the love of Jesus with them. Pure and undefiled religion is to be undefiled by the world and to visit the widows and the orphans in their distress, amen? Let's consider that and pray about that. Let's do some radical things. You know, the early church blew people away because you know what they did? When people had plagues, they didn't all freak out and overdo it. They actually risked their own lives and reached out to those, even handled people with the plague that they could get, knowing that they could get it. I'm not saying each and every person has to do that. I'm just saying it caused the gospel to spread because they didn't fear for their lives. People thought, what in the world? These guys have no fear like they're indestructible. And you know what? If you're in Christ and you're trusting him, you are indestructible. Do you know that? You have an indestructible life because your life is hidden in him. Amen? Now listen to what Eusebius. He was alive in the third century, late third century, and lived in a place called Caesarea. He was a historian. And into the fourth century, and guess what spread at that time? Famine, war, in the latter part of the third century. And then coming to the fourth century, guess what followed? Plagues. And that's what happens, by the way. When you get famine and war, plagues inevitably follow. That's the sequence we see in the horsemen too. But guess what? Eusebius recorded what the Christians were doing. He says, when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priest. Well, you know what? I'm quoting, let me quote a little bit earlier because I'm quoting somebody else that's even more radical quote. That was from Julian, the emperor, the Roman emperor, writing about what the Christians were doing. But Eusebius writes, all, all day long, some of them, speaking of the Christians, tended to the dying and to their burial because a lot of people just left, left Caesarea. War, famine, and now disease. It was one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire. Let's take off. They just fled. But there were people dying of the plague. Guess what the Christians did? All day long, some of them tended to the dying and to their burial. Countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of the city. A multitude of those uh, withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. And Eusebius goes on to uh, record how the Christian compassion uh, during this very dangerous plague, uh, what the Christians were doing and how it affected people, quote, deeds were on everyone's lips of the pagans. The Christians' deeds, listen, the Christians' deeds were on everyone's lips and they glorified the God of the Christians. Woo! Such actions convinced them that they alone were pious and truly reverent to God. Well, you could say, well, because he's a Christian historian, that's his take. But we have a letter from the emperor, not Nero. This is sometimes called the last emperor, last pagan emperor. But I don't think he really was, because I think Constantine was still pagan. You know, he said he was Roman Catholic. Uh, but anyway, the emperor Julian wrote to a pagan priest because he was upset that the Christians were shining the light of love. And he was, a, he was a, called Julian the apostate because he was brought up in a Christian home 
but he loved the Roman gods. He was like, what's going on? These Christians are outshining us with their love. And he says, for when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priest, he says by the priest, but he means pagan ones, then I think the impious Galileans, he's talking about the Christians, observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. In fact, he proposed that the priest follow the example of the Christians because it was such a strong witness. It is their benevolence, he writes, it's their benevolence of the Christians, Julian writes, the emperor, to strangers, he writes to this pagan priest, and we have his writings, okay? I was just looking at volume two of his writings, and it's there. It is their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives that they have done most to increase atheism. He means atheism, meaning no more belief in all the pagan gods, which he was upset about. He said, I believe that we, speaking of the pagans, ought to really and truly to practice every one of these virtues. We gotta be doing, you guys gotta be doing, he gives a lot of instructions on what he should be doing because of what the Christians are doing and they're shining the light. Guess what happens when there's tragedies around the world? Who are there by far more than anybody else? Christians. Do you get a lot of secular press on that? You don't get a peep out of the world. I shouldn't take that. I shouldn't say that. A big British newspaper, a homosexual writer who lived in Africa for some time said he was blown away because he see the terror on the eyes of the tribe, tribesmen of Africa that were unconverted to Christianity. He's not a Christian. A homosexual writer. And he says, but I noticed the different look on the Christian's face. And after they were building wells, water, bringing water to these places, and those who were being converted to Christianity, he said they had a joy. And they lost that tribalism of that, that, that kind of look of death. He doesn't call it look of death, but he's, that terror in their countenances would change. He was blown away. I read that article probably 10 years ago, seven years ago in this fellowship when I saw it. I thought it was very interesting that he noticed that. Guess what? People still notice when you, when you love people. It cuts through biases. It cuts through prejudices. It cuts through the lies of the evil one. Amen. And of course, there are many people who have done evil things in the name of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church, okay, and others but we need to let people understand what true Christianity is. True Christianity doesn't go around murdering people, amen, to push their faith. We preach the gospel in love and we encourage people to turn to Jesus in love. So I want to encourage you. In Matthew chapter 28, we usually focus on the verses where Jesus says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, all nations. Baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you. Verses 18, 19, and the beginning of 20, I just quoted. I should say I quoted verses 19 and beginning of verse 20. But I love the bookends on either end of those two, that one and a half verses I quoted. The verse right before verse 19 is verse 18. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. He's in charge of everything, amen? You need to keep that in mind, amen? And then at the end of verse 20, he says, after he gives the great commission to go out, he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the what? End of the age. He's with us, brothers and sisters, amen? Jesus is with us. It says he stands in the midst of the, the, the seven candlesticks, the seven lampstands, which are the seven churches he addresses. He addresses the churches because he's in the midst of the churches. This is his church. He is in our midst right now. Where two or three gather together in his name, there is he in the midst of them, amen? He's with you when you're alone. He shows up in a very special way in the context of the corporate church when they're doing the work of the church as well. But take heart that the Lord loves you, that the Lord's with you, and don't freak out, don't panic, don't bury your head. Look up, even when these things begin to come to pass or things like these are happening because he is always the answer, amen? And as these things progress, you'll start to see that he's at the door, amen? So are we gonna leave here and forget everything we just talked about and just, oh no, coronavirus! Or we just say, coronavirus, very serious, but guess what? We have a big God. Let's look to him and lift up our heads because he said these things are going to happen. And let's be lights in this world and let's reach out to the people in the nursing homes. Let's reach out to those who are hurting. Let's be on the front lines. Don't go and say, I'm going to build a picket, white fence, and just live behind it, watch everybody perish in the world until God takes me to heaven. Don't be selfish. Be a servant. Amen. Live for Jesus. Let's rise up, please. Amen. Glory to God. He is awesome. We ought to, God is word. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Father, and your truth. We rejoice in your word and your truth, Lord. We love you. And Father, we pray in your son's name if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that's not saved, that they would know that if they come to know you, your word says that we are not appointed to your wrath, those of us who know you, because your word says the world and all those who reject Jesus and 
aren't saved and aren't forgiven of their sins, Father. They are appointed to wrath, Father. Your word says it's appointed a man once to die, but after this, a judgment. And we thank you, Father, that Jesus says that those who believe in him has passed from, have passed from death to life and shall not come into condemnation. But those who reject you, Lord, and don't obey the truth, as it says in John 3.36, the wrath of God abides on them. If you're here right now and you haven't turned from your sins, the honest truth is we're all sinners and we all need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize what he's done for you. God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and as the God-man, he went to the cross and died a horrible death in your place. Took the sins you committed and that I committed, that we all committed and paid for them because guess what? He's just and criminals have to pay for what they've done. And well, he stepped in so we didn't have to pay and be separated from him in hell forever and took the penalty upon himself. And coronavirus has a very small mortality rate compared to sin. Sin is a 100% mortality rate. You're dying from it. You'll be separated from God forever. But God's word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus died for you. He's buried and he rose again and conquered the grave. Come to him right now. He said, whoever comes to him, I won't cast away and you'll be forgiven all of your sins. And he'll give you new life as you turn from sin to Jesus. You'll have eternal life through faith in him. who are saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works as anyone should brag. It's all he's doing. Look to him and he'll save you. In Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for anybody here who's been struggling with fear and anxiety that we look to you and we look to your word and we look for the opportunity to serve you and let people see our love for you and our love for one another that they may come to you and be drawn to you so they may receive forgiveness of sins. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Praise God. I usually say, give glory to God. Amen. (laughs) Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. Praise God, you guys. So, hey, you know what? We're kind of touching elbows. I think that doors, the front doors, are they open, wide open? I think we should always try to keep them open so people don't have to grab the doorknob. But I'll tell you what, maybe we have. Uh, But you know what? Right now, we were a hugging church, amen? We're a hugging church. Some people might think the last church that should stay open is Blessed Hope because they all hug each other, okay? But you know what? I usually come up here and, you know, I'm usually taking a tight corner right there. So I usually give Mark a pat or a hug and... I just gave him an elbow. He probably was like, whoa, that's kind of, you know. So you know what? Either just give a, you know, a smile, thumbs up, or just, hey, love you, or an elbow, or watch out for Peggy, you know. She's hugging people right now, but no. I'm not saying you can't hug each other, but be be concerned about the person across you. They may not want to be hugged, but go ahead and give an elbow, you know, or something. Just, but God bless you guys. Love one another. Have a beautiful day in Jesus and press on and don't forsake the fellowship of yourselves together unless you have to.